Hey guys, I just got back from Pulse Cup in Melbourne. Uh, I had a great time. It's, uh, I've been preparing for the event since Opus 6 dropped. Um, I've been working on this list, uh, which is actually one of my first ideas for Opus 6. So it's awesome that it turned out to be like a legitimately powerful deck. Um, a lot of people have been asking about it and it's hard to get back to everyone specifically. So that's why I'm putting out this video. Um, firstly, I was the only undefeated in Swiss with seven rounds. Um, the first round was a buy from a regionals win. And then all six of my opponents actually went on to make top 16 as well. Um, uh, I lost 1-2 in top 8 to uh, like an all-in discard dull ice deck. Um, it's like a usual Thaumaturge, Sarah, Argef, Edward, etc. Um, but this uh, deck had 3 Shiver and the backup that gets to Ice Summons back. Um, usually, so usually my matchup against Ice is really, really good because I can just put out costless spotties in front of like Genesis and that kind of thing while I build backups and then you just outvalue them because they can't actually remove anything. Um, but this deck's plan to like shiver every turn, let him cheese damage through the wider boards. So even if I stabilized, he could still get those last points of damage through. Um, but anyway. Onto the deck, which worked super well. Um, it was like awesome. Uh, people were watching, being like, "This deck's insane!" Like, I love this. I want to see this deck win the event and stuff. Um, but uh, starting with the the core of the deck, obviously, is Layla. Now, Layla is my favorite card in Opus Six by far. Um, I think it is one of the best cards in Opus Six, if not the best. Um, it is basically it's cool because it's not actually unfair in the way other good cards are unfair, like Genesis and stuff like that. It's good just because it is a super duper efficient way to get bodies out and they're they're off they're terrible bodies like they're really weak bodies but it lets you get two bodies out for super cheap uh, super efficiently and it's also quite reliable because it costs four so it means you can play at turn one and have two bodies turn one efficiently um it also means you can devout it out so you can turn you can play one cp to get out two bodies and draw a card so you actually gain a cp and two bodies on the field just from cracking it about um, and it also has super good synergy with another Opus 6 card, Renoa. Now, obviously Renoa on a Layla gives you two extra bodies. You get the Renoa and also the Viking that Layla brings out, if you have another Viking in there. Or, or of course, you can also just use Renoa on Viking, and that gets you draw two off of a 4 for 7k. So that's insane as well. You basically got a zero cost 7k, and that's just like a base case. Um, there's obviously much crazier things you can do with Renoa if you have the right stuff out. Um, Cloud of Darkness is a uh, one of the big reasons for the deck. So obviously, just putting a bunch of little bodies on the field doesn't actually get you anywhere because you can't get through bigger things. And that's what Cloud of Darkness is for. Uh, well, one of that's one of the things, um, one of the cards that it, it helps with that. Um, so in this deck, Cloud of Darkness is really easy to resolve for uh, Neg Eight K or more on entry, and then you've got Renoa to reuse it if you need to. And also the on attack lets you push the other attackers through sometimes too. And in fact, you can actually kill some pretty decently sized things with a Cloud of Darkness attack in this deck, just because you can create so many bodies so easily. You can get to like Neg Seven K and stuff like that. Now then, we've also got super duper consistency in water with Bran and Merwib. So Bran obviously gets you the 3 CP Viking that you need for a bunch of the stuff in your deck to work, and it's an EX2, which is really nice. Um, Merwib was a much later addition in the deck. I didn't have it in it for quite a while, and, but when I realized, it seemed like a really innocuous card, but once I realized to put it in, it was a huge step up because it actually gets you everything you want in the deck. So obviously if you don't have Layla, but you have Viking, you can get Layla. If you don't have, if you have Layla, but not Viking, you can get Viking. If you've already got both, you can get Cloud of Darkness. So it's good at basically any point in the game in any kind of situation. So that was a really good addition. And then, yeah, like I was talking about with Devout, your two main targets in this deck are Layla and Renoa, but that's all you really need because the Layla lets you develop bodies and the Renoa lets you turn your, uh, either lets you develop more bodies or turn your removals into like double double ups. So like Cloud of Darkness, for example. And um, that's like the core. So I'll talk about some of the other cards. Uh, these are the extra cards that kind of round out the, the core, which fit in really nicely. Um, we've got the Ice Standard Unit Thaumaturge, which I was talking about before. Um, another essentially costless body. It's weak, but it's efficient. And uh, the one cost Viking. Now I like the one cost Viking a lot better than the two cost Viking. Um, if you're not playing stuff like Lena and Renault, uh, Refia, because the it's still this, exactly the same value because you, you know that one, that Viking will die at some point. However, it's one CP cheaper, so you're basically every every time you play two one cost Vikings uh, instead of two two cost Vikings, you basically draw an extra card uh, in that game if you were playing two cost Vikings instead. Um, then obviously Gladiator is a super nice backup that fits really nicely as well. You get the super value off the Viking. It basically lets you turn 
So you, you tap two to uh, trigger Viking, uh, Gladiator, and then Viking comes out and you draw a card. So you get the, the CP back, but it turns your backups into a body, which can help for Cloud of Darkness and Kefka and stuff like that. So that's Kefka is another um, a big thing in this deck. It's a really good removal. The fact that it kills monsters is actually a big deal. Um, but yeah, it's super easy to resolve and it, it resolves efficiently even. You can get three Vikings, uh, you can yeah, sacrifice three Vikings for it quite easily. Layla's an easy thing to sack. Stambler is an easy thing to sack. Even Snow is alright. Um, now Time Age is basically another Renoa, but it's a two cost backup version. Obviously it's more expensive, but it is it still lets you reuse these powerful entry effects that we have in here because of Renoa. And there's not really any other two cost ice backups that we would rather than that. And then of course we have Mattius, which lets you push your cheap bodies through and your opponent can't even see um, that that's there. Like, you know, obviously they can see when you drop a Cloud of Darkness on them or a Kefka or whatever, but they can't see a Mattis in your hand. So you swing with like a little Viking and they've got like a bigger blocker on the field. They they have to make the decision that they're like, well, if I block, I could get mattius But um, maybe he's just... Even if they do block and you don't have a Mattis, even if they call your bluff, you're just drawing a card off the Viking anyway. That's not too bad a... Um, uh, like consolation prize and they know that so often it actually does let you just push little bodies through even if you don't have the Mattias it just, it just really lets you um, attack a lot more aggressively with your little bodies uh, than it really should let you do that and then Genesis Avatar this is uh, big in this deck um, it's a board clear so this deck has a board clear as a one sided board clear and it's really cheap because of Renoa and also can be done entirely from your hand too. So Renoa has made Avatar a lot better uh, for two reasons. One, because you can now use Devout as you know a one CP way to trigger the Avatar again. You know, obviously best case, you say you've got five backups, you could have a hand of just Avatar, Renoa, and five backups including Devout, and that's a board wipe because you discard the Renoa, play the Avatar, crack the Devout, get the Renoa out. Uh, but even then, you can have a hand of you know, some amount of cards and just drop Avatar and Renault on the field. It gets through Emperor that way as well. Um, and that's, that's a big surprise because they can't see the Time Age there in that case. Although, of course, if you have Time Age, you can do your regular Genesis Avatar Time Age. And in fact, it's kind of funny. You can even sometimes, if you already have Avatar out, you can actually resolve it again from the field just from having Time Age and Devout for Renoa. Um, so that, that board clear is so good here. And that's the, the rest of the um, kind of additional core. And then the rest of the deck is like kind of some some extra slots that you got so a lot of options around um snow actually turned out to be really good in here so kind of re re returning back to like kind of opus 3 strategy here with the snow sarah now snow sarah is obviously snow without sarah is average um some decks it's good other times it's pretty bad but um so with sarah is actually a threat to a lot of decks so constantly um especially again when we have all these little bodies snow lets you um cheat through bigger blockers uh, really easily and efficiently, especially when it's combined with something like Mattias, then you can get through like double big bodies, you know, even if they have multiple bigger bodies, you've got all these ways to get through them and push like lots of damage through, you know, because you've got these boards of these efficient, costless forwards. If your opponent removes them, if they spent any kind of removal on them, they're not really getting value for their removal, but if they leave them there, they're threatened to take like three or four damage at once. Um, so Shiver plays into that as well, um, and with Snow it's even cooler because you get the Freeze too. So Shiver lets you close out games um, against decks that don't have any reactivation and stuff like that. Um, that that's probably that being said, Shiver is probably the 49th and 50th slot in a deck. Uh, those two slots could go to a lot of other cards as well, depending what you need. Um, so of all the cards I would consider dropping, Shiver is probably the one. Although it, it does it does its job, and also you do kind of need a little bit more ice cards than water cards in here, just so you can resolve Avatar when you have it, because Avatar typically needs two ice cards in addition to the Avatar and say the Time Age up or the Renoa. Um, I, and with Sarah Snow, I should say I will always play three Sarah with the Snow because you you want to see the Sarah first. The Snow is significantly worse without it. Again, it's still decent against some decks without it, but you do want to see the Sarah first. And a lot of these backups, like we've got Gladiator and Time Age anyway, which are like standard units that don't have the unique clause. So you've still, having that one uh, unique backup that you have three copies of isn't too bad. It's not big of a hindrance. And then we have Nidhogg. Now, this is the, the Dark Light slot in this deck. Um, this is the pretty obvious option, just because its enter ability is so insane and you draw so many cards that you could actually resolve it pretty reliably. Like it doesn't really brick in your hand. Um, and then, you know, Renoa, Time Age, etc. This is probably the most raw value you can get out of those two cards, is resolving a Nidhogg again. Um, but he also 
fills the role of unconditional removal. So with Kefka and Cloud of Darkness, um, and even Avatar, so Kefka and Cloud of Darkness, you do need an amount of bodies to get that removal on their bigger forward. Uh, Matthias, you need them to block, etc. But um, an Avatar, you need the combo piece to go with it. With Nidhogg though, it is it just removes a threat without having to have any other setup or any other requirements. And also the, the random hand move is, I don't know why they put that in the game, like a random removal from the hand, but that can really uh, mess your opponent up. And when you cast Nidhogg, often you can push people into using their, car, like their summon they've been saving or whatever, for example, uh, prematurely because they don't want to lose it to the Nidhogg. So I had that happen when I played a Nidhogg and my opponent had Chaos Walker of the Wheel in his hand and he didn't want to risk losing the Walker, uh, so he just used it on the Nidhogg. Um, but like, it, yeah, the, the effect is insane and you, you can just resolve it in this deck so easily. Um, but that's basically the core of the deck. So essentially you're just playing little... Costless bodies, so cheap, super efficient guys that your opponent can't remove efficiently. You know, Shanto doesn't help, Valifor doesn't help because you just get all your cards back. Um, and then you've got ways to push those bodies through for damage. And also by having all those bodies, you've also got blockers so you don't get aggroed out. And you've got a board clear on top so with the avatar so that if the game goes long, then you still win because you just will eventually just wipe their board and kill them. Uh, basically, there's, there's so many things... Um, about the deck that make it hard for your opponent, a lot of hard for a lot of uh, decks to actually deal with it and do anything about it. They basically have no options against it, which is really really good. So I had one card I forgot to talk about was Hilda. Um, this is uh, another. It's a little bit lower on the list of inclusions, but it is insane to resolve it for four. Even three is decent. Like a zero cost backup is pretty good. Um, I might consider dropping it to one. Um, Potentially to put the third avatar back in. Um, I did have three avatar for a long time, but I kept drawing extra copies that I didn't need, and I, a lot of games I didn't actually need it, so I dropped it to two. Um, but Hil uh, Hilda is kind of like an auto win if you resolve it for four, which you can. Although in the matchups where you are having trouble, you maybe it's a bit harder to get four out. So in the matchups that you could lose, Hilda sometimes doesn't help, which is why I would consider dropping it a little bit. Um, it feels like, you know, it, in your head, it looks like win more. And that was my original thought. I wasn't uh, too keen on it for quite a while. But once I tried it out more and with this kind of list with like the one cost Vikings and the snows to make it really easy to resolve, I started realizing it's nuts and I put it in for like that auto win um, potential and it has been really good. Now, one concern people talk about with this deck, they think, oh, aren't you going to deck out sometimes? Like, aren't you worried about decking yourself out? And no, not really, because if I'm drawing that many cards that I'm going to deck myself out, and I don't win the game, then I've done something else wrong. Like, if you're drawing that many cards that you can deck yourself out like that, then you should have won anyway, because you have so many cards over your opponent. And that's what always happened. Like, I did get quite a low deck in some of my games in Swiss. Like, I went down to five three maybe cards but in those games i i never felt like i was going to lose because you know once i'm down that far i can just keep putting bodies out still and your opponent just runs out of things the ways to deal with them um i, I brute forced through uh three phoenix and two diablos against a like a rainbow summon deck i brute forced through uh two valifors and a shantoto against the monster deck uh, you basically it doesn't matter how many times they wipe your board, the fours just keep coming back and they are just going to run out of ways to do that and you will just kill them. Um, so it's actually quite hard to deck out just because you'll probably win in the games that that becomes a threat. Um, but that's that's the entire deck. Uh, I just want to talk about some of the cards that uh, are options because there is actually a lot of options here with the water, ice, kind of swarmy sort of, and then your ice has got a lot of good cards as well. So there are heaps of options to play in this. Um, I this, this kind of set... It's something that I work with quite a bit, the whole Shelk, Refia, Viking, Mime. Uh, I think Shelk is awesome, like a super cool forward, and, you know, it plays really nicely into the Refia, Viking, and Mime, which also support each other. Uh, and that was really good, like, I that was working really well, but I found it wasn't necessary in the end. It was, you know, it was a lot of cheap, efficient bodies, but they had some kind of condition attached to them. So, obviously, Shelk, you need the two costs to go with it. Mime isn't actually as efficient as the others because if they remove it straight away, it didn't get any value. And the two cost Viking I've talked about, I don't like as much as the other two Vikings. Um, so Lena is you know, another efficient uh, card to go with those. It's like a, basically a conditional one cost 7k, which I found I didn't really want because, um, you know, I've got all these cheap bodies anyway. I don't need a one cost 7k that is only live sometimes. And also that would also force me to play the two cost Viking, which I don't want to. 
Um, but still, that is a lot of that's stuff to work with and some really cool uh, ways to develop the board and put pressure. Um, Trickster and Psychom are like really interesting gladiator options. Uh, Trickster is for Scions specifically. Uh, it's actually decent against Modern Lightning sometimes too. But you know, Scions, you play Trickster, you gladiator out of Trickster again, they try and kill it. Um, it's <laughs> pretty cute way to kind of brick wall them. And then Psychom uh, lets you, you know, against monster decks and like cactuars and stuff that will kill those off for you if you need to do that. Uh, some other options. Uh, these cards, it's just some extra things you could play. Like, Borgen is really cool with Kefka. It's like a one cost, um, it's like basically like the one CP Viking for ice. Uh, and that is a little bit worse than one cost Viking in general, just because you're probably going to play around the discard. But in the case of Kefka, obviously you force it. So he's kind of cool. Snow Giant is like a nice thing that kind of sits there and, um, uh, can let you push damage through when you need to. Uh, Genesis, obviously, is a great option. The reason it's not in the deck by default is because of Avatar, so he kind of blocks Avatar off, although he is a very, very good card anyway. And again, he lets you push through a, um, one body, and he's a really good devout option too. So Genesis is probably, at the moment, he's like the 51st or 52nd card. So, you know, if you drop anything, you'd probably put Genesis in over it at the moment. Uh, Fanfrit, obviously, works really well with your Vikings, your cheap bodies, and it lets you... Um, kill bigger bodies for nothing really. It's a good EX too. Uh, that's one of the things that would push me to playing it if I chose to do that. Yule Astro was something I had in at the start. It's a really cute um, ice water backup combination. Uh, what I found out is that um, Yule actually is really good without Astro in this deck because you know you've so often you're playing like Landlord or Viking and drawing a card. Knowing what you're going to draw can actually really help your lines and help you decide whether you want to draw that card or whether you want to you know, play the Kefka sacking the Vikings and, you know, because you know what you're going to draw, maybe that could be something that helps, basically puts it in your hand without actually putting it in your hand. Um, and that was really awesome. I loved it a lot. However, um, unfortunately, Yule does have a drawback, fair enough. And that actually came up in some of my testing games. So against decks with Archer, I actually, Yule was actually a liability. Um, it started, th there would be games where I would be able to win except the threat of the Archer on the Yule when I was playing with 10 less cards in my deck and that actually lost me the game. A couple of times, so I had to drop it in the end. Even though I love the uh, look at the top card effect in this deck, it also it's cool because um, when they're attacking you, you can look at your top card, and if it's like a a Bran, you can let the damage through, or if it's a card you want to draw, you can block it with the Viking and draw it. Um, so it just has so much cool interactions, and then Astro just goes well with that. But um, yeah, uh, light and dark options. There are other good ones. Um, Terra is uh, much cheaper than Nidhogg, so if you ever find that you're bricking Nidhogg in your hand, it's this big expensive dark card you can't play, then Terra's another a nicer option, which is much cheaper, and it lets you, you know, easily get the Manius and the Shiver, so Shiver to close out the game, or the Manius to keep pushing damage. And then Sephiroth, actually. Now, this is a card that doesn't really see play very often, or if ever, but it's actually one of the best enter abilities for, um, to reuse with Renoa and Time Age. And even in this deck, you can kill a Minwu, which stops your avatar. So for something like Gullwings, Gullwings with Minwu, that, that's a deck you can't really push through if they have that setup. But Sephiroth lets you kill the Minwu and then you can avatar them. Um, it's kind of funny, but yeah, Nidhogg in general, I felt was better overall. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for watching. I hope this has helped with a lot of people that I've been getting questions from about, about my deck and things I, uh, you know, tried out or like how I came about the deck and stuff like that. Um, I think this archetype is really, really good and I expect it to become more popular now as uh, now that it's like, you know, out in the open. Uh, I should I want to thank a lot of the people that helped me prepare. So I want to thank um, Josh Gee for talking with me about the deck a lot and like, you know, switching lists back and forth. Um, thank you, uh, like Ryan Stolarski, Sam Prime for testing with me and also talking about the deck and stuff. Um, thank you to the people who kept my tech a secret when I played against them, and I asked them not to mention it to people from Australia in, in particular. Um, you know, there, uh, there was one Australian, Robert Meadows, who actually figured out it was me, um, and he but he kept my secret for me, and that was really uh, good of him, and I really appreciate that. Um, and also, thanks a lot to Joe Hill. Uh, I found out that he was working on a water ice kind of Viking sort of deck, and I asked him uh, as a favor if he could not post about it until after the event. And um, I said, that's fine. You, if, if you want to, you can, of course, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm asking this as a favor. And he was like, yes, of course, because he's a wonderful guy and, um, you know, really nice and would always do something like that for someone. So now there you go, uh, Joe, you were onto this awesome deck as well. And uh, everyone knows that. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for everything. Thanks for watching, guys. Cheers.